Welcome, everyone, and thank you all very much for coming. I hope the people in the gallery aren't too uncomfortable. Um, I have one health and safety notice I'm required to give. If the fire alarm goes off, it will be a fire, and you will need to get out quickly. But the advantage of being in the gallery is that we are required to allow the people in the gallery out first. <laughs> so if the people in the gallery could come down as quickly as possible, and as soon as they're out, um, these doors will then be opened for everybody else. Um, I hope there won't be a fire. So, Canterbury, a history since 1500. And of course, the first question has to be, why since 1500? In 2007, I trained as a Canterbury City Guide, and the more local history I read, the more I discovered how neglected the last 500 years were. General histories of Canterbury talk about the Romans and Augustine, about Becket and the pilgrim trade, and then they sort of fizzle out and maybe give one chapter to the last 500 years. So this book is designed to fill that gap. Now, my problem today is how to squeeze 500 years of history into about 40, 45 minutes. And since this is a story of a city and its people, I'm going to chart some of the changes that would have impacted on people's lives and hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of the book. This is what Canterbury would have looked like around 1500. A city with lots of green spaces within the city walls. And a population of some 4,000, maybe 5,000. So by our standards, it was tiny. But in the 16th century, it was a very substantial place. One of the 10 biggest provincial cities in the country, and by far the largest place in Kent. Since it was situated on the main road from London to Dover, anyone traveling between London and the continent would have passed through it. Sorry, I can't see these slides, but that's all right. Because what I'm showing you here is the other really famous thing for Canterbury, which was one of the most visited and awe-inspiring shrines in the country. Indeed, more than that, one of the most visited and awe-inspiring shrines in Europe. And it may have looked a bit like this. By 1500, pilgrimage was in decline, but we know from the meticulous records kept by the monks of Christchurch Priory that it was rare, even in the cold winter months, for a day to pass without an offering being made at Becket's shrine. Against that background, imagine what it was like if you were living in Canterbury in the late 1530s. And I hope you've now got up a map which shows you that half of the land was taken up by religious houses, and they're marked in gray on this map, including two of the greatest monasteries in the country. And then, between 1537 and 1540, totally out of the blue, so far as the citizens of Canterbury were concerned, all seven were closed down. And in the middle of this period, the famous shrine, which 
had brought so much wealth and fame to Canterbury was smashed to smithereens. Part of Henry VIII's determination to purge his English church of what he saw as superstitious practices. Well, the government was determined that religious houses should be made unfit for monastic purposes. There were two vast churches at St. Augustine's Abbey, at St. Gregory's Priory, and along with the cathedral, they dominated the city skyline. Those churches, along with a lot of other monastic buildings, were all demolished between 1537 and 1540. Not until the bombing raid of 1942 would the people of Canterbury witness such a marked change to the landscape of their city, or incidentally, see so much rubble. And it wasn't just monks, nuns, and friars whose lives were affected. Think of the innkeepers and souvenir makers. Think of the tradesmen who supplied the religious houses. And think of all the people whom the big monasteries employed, porters, grooms, bakers, brewers, servants, errand boys. The religious changes of the 16th century, from Catholic to Protestant to Catholic and back to Protestant again, were changes imposed from above. And it seems that most citizens, here as everywhere else, simply acquiesced in them. There wasn't actually much else they could do. But Canterbury was a market town situated on key trading routes. And new ideas were often transmitted along such routes. And so there were some people in Canterbury who embraced new religious ideas from the continent before they were imposed by the government. For example, there was John Tofts, a Canterbury lawyer who was vehemently opposed to religious images. And in 1542, he was accused, and I quote, of taking a picture of Our Lady from his church to his home where he did hew her all in pieces. One of the women in his family claimed, and I quote again, that her daughter could piss as good holy water as the priest could make any. So you've got some people in Canterbury who are embracing reformed ideas. At the same time, there are other citizens who remained loyal to the old ways even after they'd been abolished. One old custom, for example, was to light bonfires to mark saints' days. In June 1561, when Elizabeth was establishing Protestantism as the national religion, Richard Burroughs, nicknamed Railing Dick, supervised the building of a huge fire in the butter market. And he led a procession of a hundred boys singing bawdy songs and mocking Protestants. So religious conflict was reaching right down to grassroots level. Um, there are a few seats right at the front here. So, so, uh, so. What you're looking at now is what Canterbury may have looked like at the time that hundreds of refugees arrived here. Because lots of Protestants fled Catholic persecution in what was known as the Low Countries, 
and they came to what by then was Protestant England. And these were Walloons and, Flom and Flemings. And they tended to congregate in ports such as Sandwich, at which they landed. But the government was rather twitchy, in fact, very twitchy, about the idea of too many strangers, as they called them, in one place. And so the Privy Council asked other towns to take some. And in 1575, Canterbury City Council agreed to accept 100 refugee families. But, they specified, they did not want the meanest sort. Does this sound at all familiar? What they wanted was skilled craftsmen who might benefit the city. We know from tax records that some early stranger families lived in the Turnagain Lane houses, which you're looking at there. The top story weaving loft with huge windows either side was added later, but it reminds us that many of the early refugees were strangers, were, were weavers. The council was anxious that these newcomers shouldn't threaten the livelihoods of native citizens. And so the strangers were allowed to make cloth after the Flanders fashion, but not cloth or curses such as the English do make. In other words, they mustn't compete with the native citizens at their own game. And to ensure that they didn't com compete with city traders, they were only allowed to sell their goods wholesale, not retail. Now, what this meant was that the strangers operated as a separate community within the wider community of the city. The council didn't want them to be a drain on city resources, so they were required to provide for their own poor and educate their own children. They also worshipped separately. Everyone else was required to worship in their parish churches. But the strangers were allowed to hold religious services in their own language and according to their own rites. Initially, in St. Alphage Church, but then from 1576, in the crypt of the cathedral, where they've worshipped every Sunday for over 400 years. And this cartouche, which you can see in the side chapel, which the French church, French church uses now, probably dates from the 16th century. Now, in the last quarter of the 16th century, the number of strangers increased dramatically, which is why they were offered the use of the crypt. It's very difficult to judge numbers, but by the end of the century, a fifth or a quarter, maybe even more, of the population were French-speaking refugees. So French would regularly have been heard on the streets of Canterbury. A hundred years later, there was a further influx of refugees, this time from France itself people we know as Huguenots. And like many asylum seekers today, they arrived with very little. But the Walloon congregation had a long tradition of aiding fellow exiles. And the accounts of the French church 
record gifts of money, food, clothing, medicine, and sadly, shrouds to les Francais. So, Huguenots were a significant presence in Canterbury. That's not surprising. The city was easily reached from the Channel ports, and it had an established French-speaking church. And so by the end of the 17th century, Canterbury had the largest foreign community in England outside London. The Huguenots boosted Canterbury's silk weaving industry. We know that in the 1690s, there were around a thousand looms in the city. But by 1719, so a bare quarter of a century later, that number had dropped to just 334. Why? Because of competition from India, where workers were paid less, so cloth could be produced more cheaply. Again, is this familiar? And it became increasingly difficult for provincial weavers to make a living. And so in the early 18th century, many weavers from towns such as Norwich, and Canterbury, including many Huguenots, moved to Spitalfields. But as silk weaving declined, another industry was developing. Daniel Defoe, who visited Canterbury in the early 1720s, commented on the massive recent surge in hop growing. Local inhabitants, Defoe Wright, could remember when there was not an acre of land planted with hops in the whole neighborhood. Whereas I was assured that there are at this time near 6,000 acres of ground so planted within a very few miles of the city. I don't know how much detail you can see on this 18th century map, um, but it shows hop gardens right up to the city walls. In 1766, a weekly hop market was added to all the other markets, which regularly drew farmers and traders from estates and villages around to the city. Now, Canterbury had always been the hub of its region. And this was reflected in the name of its first newspaper. The Kent Kentish Post or Canterbury Newsletter, set up in 1717. And advertisements in the post give us an invaluable impression of 18th century Canterbury. For example, it advertised what were known as flying machines, stagecoaches which picked up passengers and parcels at a variety of coaching inns in the city, taking them on to London or Dover. Now, the journey to London took about 11 hours, so it wouldn't have been very comfortable, particularly for those prepared to sit outside and brave the elements, which did, however, reduce the price to the fair to half price 
Adverts in the post also give us an impression of the city's social and recreational provision. Because Canterbury was one of many English towns which in the 18th century sought to expand the facilities it offered for the leisured classes. And one amenity which any fashionable town wanted was its own pleasure gardens, modelled on the Vauxhall Gardens in London. And in 1752, the Kentish Post announced the opening of Vauxhall Gardens in Canterbury. And if you want to know where these were, just look at present day road names. Another essential was a theatre. So in the 1730s, the upper story of the market hall in the Butter Market, which may have looked something like the picture that you can see top left, that upper story was converted into a theatre. Replaced in the 1790s by a much bigger one in Orange Street. And any of you who are very observant will realize that the photos I've taken of the Orange Street Theatre were taken some time ago, but they do show that it used to say Theatre House. And I deeply regret that that name has now been removed. And the Post advertised what went on in the theatres. I wouldn't have realized, if it hadn't been for adverts in the post, that often two plays were performed back to back. So in 1744, a performance of The Merchant of Venice in the Market Hall was followed immediately by a farce, The Devil to Pay or The Wives Metamorphosed. Well, as many of you may know, the high point of Canterbury's recreational year was the annual race meeting on the Barham Downs. In 1765, the Mozart family attended the races on their way back from London. And the Post advertised a concert by the eight-year-old Mozart in the town hall. But sadly, the child apparently had a cold, and it appears that the concert never took place. <laughs> Canterbury even had its own mineral springs, discovered in the 1690s on the site of the present Pound Lane car park. One early visitor, however, said they produced an ill water, so she only drank half a glass. And William Gosling, who published a guide to Canterbury in 1774, recorded that the springs were never so much in fashion as to crowd the town with visitors. That's important. 18th century Canterbury had everything that an aspiring social centre needed. But like many other comparable towns, it never acquired national status. It couldn't compete with spas such as Bath, or even with its upstart neighbour, Tunbridge Wells. The recreational facilities which Canterbury provided were for its own leisured citizens and for families who regularly visited from estates and villages around. Maybe bringing marriageable aged daughters to a place where they might meet future husbands.
This is Alderman James Simmons, printer, mill owner, banker, and founder of the Kentish Gazette, the successor to the Kentish Post. Described, as you can see by a biographer, as Canterbury's great tycoon. Simmons made a huge difference to Canterbury because in 1787, he managed to get Parliament to pass what was known as an Improvement Act for the better paving, cleansing, lighting, and watching of Canterbury. Lots of towns were getting Improvement Acts. And what Simmons wanted to do was to replace medieval disorder with cleaner, more elegant street lines. The Act set up a commission which had draconian powers. For example, it had the right to order people to alter houses which encroached too far onto the streets. So the owners of 33 high street properties were instructed to cut their windows back so that they didn't stick out more than nine inches. And once such encroachments were removed, the whole city was repaved. In addition to his work on the Improvement Commission, Simmons also paid £1,500 out of his own pocket to transform the Dane John fields, transforming them from rough pasture land into landscaped gardens for public use. And you may be able just to see in the background of his portrait the memorial which was a monument which was erected to him in 1803 to commemorate all the things he'd done for Canterbury. Well, in this whistle-stop tour of five centuries, we've now reached the time of the Napoleonic Wars, which caused the government to order new permanent barracks to be built in a number of strategic locations. And not surprisingly, Canterbury was one of these. For the next century, soldiers were to be a very visible presence in the city. And that meant that lots of pubs in Canterbury had military names, and there was also a good supply of brothels, such as the one you can see here, the old harlotry commemorated um, in Northgate. Now, the number of soldiers varied hugely from year to year. But in 1809, when the resident population was around 12,000, there were 3,750 officers and men in the Canterbury Barracks. So soldiers were the 19th century equivalent of students today. <laughs> a population of 12,000 is a reminder that by the 19th century, Canterbury, which had been one of the big towns of England in 1500, was now massively outnumbered by the mushrooming cities of the industrial north. But surprisingly, people here were among the first in England to have the opportunity to travel by train. The Canterbury Whitstable Railway, as I'm sure you all know, was opened four and a half months before the more famous Liverpool-Manchester line. And it even boasted the world's first season ticket for the sea bathing season 
between the 25th of March and the 1st of November. But it was the other railway lines which opened in the succeeding decades that made a big difference to Canterbury. Initially, the city seemed to lose out from the coming of the railways. Because for centuries, all the main London to Dover traffic had passed through Canterbury. But when a railway line was opened from London to Ashford in 1842, Canterbury was bypassed. In the 1830s, as many as 90 stagecoaches a week had come to or through Canterbury, the railway just put them totally out of business. And hoteliers and innkeepers complained about loss of trade. But in the longer term, there were benefits. Guidebooks were soon stressing how cheaply and expeditiously the city could be reached from London by the omnipotent agency of steam. Cheap pleasure excursions were introduced. Day trips, which gave people from Canterbury the chance to spend seven hours in Brighton or nine in London. <coughs> Businesses willing to seize the opportunities offered by technological progress thrived. Iron founders such as Biggleston's, which had premises at the back of what I still think of as Nason's, supplied girders for the railway bridges of Kent. Speedy deliveries from London gave rise to a new form of trading. The establishment of big department stores in place of small specialist shops. What you're looking at here is Finn's in St. Margaret's Street. And I was about to lead a walk in that area and I suddenly realized that, in fact, we still have quite a bit of the 19th century frontage. But what particularly interests me about this picture are the horses in the foreground. Because the railways gave a huge boost to horse-drawn transport. It was needed to take goods and passengers from the stations to shops and hotels, and also to villages that weren't on the train line. So by the 1880s, carriers from Canterbury were serving 43 different locations. In 1841, there were around 30 saddlers and tanners in Canterbury. By 1901, that number had gone up to 204. So the railway is giving a real boost to anything associated with horses. By contrast, some other traditional occupations declined. Things like shoes, which were once made locally, could now be mass-produced elsewhere and transported by rail all around the country. So the number of men employed in shoemaking firms in Canterbury went down from 234 in 1841 to just 99 60 years later. Well, the railway revolution was the first 
of a series of transport changes which changed the lives of people in Canterbury. In 1895, police were alerted, I quote, to the danger of furious riding by cyclists through the city. <laughs> the equivalent of today's e-scooters, do you think? Did you know that for a short time, cars were made in Canterbury? Between 1903 and 1906, Henry Dawson advertised four models of a Canterbury car manufactured at his Roadhouse Town Works near the East Station. Dawson, incidentally, even tried his hand at aviation, and in June 1910, he trialed a light aircraft on St. Martin's Hill. But he only managed to get it to rise a foot above the ground. But of course, during the First World War, people in Canterbury got used to seeing planes flying overhead. And in 1917, they were even able to go and see a Gother bomber, which crashed at Broad Oak. Technological change, of course, also affected entertainment. This is Canterbury's first cinema, known as the Electric Theatre, which opened in 1910. And here, barely a quarter of a century later, is one of the two state-of-the-art Art Deco cinemas, which were both opened on the same day, the 5th of August, 1933. What you're looking at is the now defunct Odeon, which was originally called the Regal, which lost its original symmetry in World War II bombing. The right side was destroyed. The other cinema opened the same day was the Friars, where the Marlow now stands. Kenneth Pinnock, who grew up in the interwar years, record the appeal of cinemas to which the people of Canterbury, like those everywhere else, flocked in their hundreds. The air of luxury, he said, was staggering. Acres of wall-to-wall -wall carpet at a time when most people had to be content with chilly lin linoleum, deliciously warm, banishing thoughts of unheated bedrooms. Kenneth Pinnock grew up in a relatively well-off home. His father ran a small business. But many inhabitants of Canterbury lived in far less salubrious conditions. Way back in the 1840s, a Canterbury doctor, George Rigdon, wrote a report on the sanitary condition of Canterbury pointing out that in St. Gregory's Square, there are 39 adult persons and 43 children residing in 26 rooms. It is not drained, nor has it but one pump and one privy for the use of all its inhabitants. I reckon that's one loo for 82 people. Rigdon also drew attention to huge variations in city death rates. 13 to 15 per thousand in St. Dunstan's and St. George's, but double that 30 per thousand in poor, low-lying wards such as St. Alphage, close to the smelly, polluted river. A generation after Rigdon, another city doctor, Frank Wacher, kept telling the authorities that some residents of Canterbury lived in homes unfit for habitation. But major slum, slum clearance didn't happen until the interwar years, which was when the government, keen, you remember, to supply homes fit for heroes, ordered local councils 
to demolish slums and build new council houses. Ah, have we lost it there as well? Or I've lost the picture. Have you got a picture? No. Um, what you are supposed to be looking at <laughs> is a list of the 14 areas in Canterbury which were designated for slum clearance. And huge files in the cathedral archives show that some house owners objected. For example, Gertrude Moyes said that she was a spinster aged 65. She rented out her property at 8 Knots Lane, which is where Holmesbower House stands now, and she protested, it is very hard losing nine shillings a week. I have spent a lot on the roof, and I do object to having it pulled down. But it wasn't just the landlords who objected. Another 65-year-old, Mr. Wilkins, who described himself as a partial cripple, had lived at two Woolpack cottages for 40 years. And with any luck, it would have been in one of those cottages that Mr. Wilkins lived. The house, he said, was a refuge from the traffic and it would break his heart to be turned out. But pleas such as these were fruitless. The Ministry of Health confirmed the clearance orders, and by 1939, the council was able to tell the government that 245 houses had been demolished and 741 people displaced. Vast new council houses, um, vast new council estates, I'm sure, sorry, the houses weren't vast, were built on the outskirts of the city. But people who'd always lived in the centre were sometimes loath to move out. Can you move it on for me, Philip, please? What I hope you may see soon is the east end of Canterbury, just after the 1942 Baedeker Raid. There are, and totally flattened, you can still see on the picture you can't see, um, <laughs> St. George's Tower. We think the picture was taken from Marks and Spencer's roof, which was about the only thing that was left standing in that area of the city. And there are lots of first-hand accounts from people who were children at the time. I love the description provided by a Simon Langton schoolboy who cycled to school the next morning, and there it was, gone. <laughs> a little girl on the Querns Road estate recalled that the rabbits they kept in the garden were blown to bits. All the bits of rabbit hanging up in the tree. Well, planning for the future started, oh, that is what you should have been looking at. So planning for the future started almost immediately. And you can imagine the excitement of architects throughout the country when they're given the brief of redesigning whole city centers from scratch. The scheme drew, drew on up for Canterbury doesn't seem to be working. Can you move me on one? Uh, the scheme which was drawn up for Canterbury included, among other things, a great double-lane boulevard, which I hope I may be able to show you soon, stretching from a new civic centre in the Dane John Gardens to the heart of the city. But there was a lot of local opposition, as in other towns. Letters of protest poured into the Gazette from people signing themselves a lover of Canterbury, lifelong Canterburian. 
and significantly, simply rate payer. <laughs> In the end, nearly all the schemes, Canterbury's included, had to be massively watered down because building materials were scarce and priority had to be given to housing. And so the proposed boulevard was never built and we still have only half of the planned ring road. Oh, what's happening now? There is the boulevard. Do you remember when many of us were teenagers and dressed like that? <laughs> um, these are the first students arriving at the University of Kent in October 1965. The city they arrived in was still a small provincial market town. It had a population of around 30,000. And it was full of small family-run shops. The trade directories reveal that in the mid-60s, there were 35 grocers in Canterbury, 20 butchers, along with 18 clothes shops in the high street, in the main street alone. Well, I don't need to spell out to you this afternoon the changes we've witnessed since then with the growth of higher education and tourism. Though you'll find a discussion of those things in the last chapter of the book. <laughs> Suffice it to say that change has been a constant feature of the city's life. And life does not always turn out how people expect. A child growing up in early 16th century Canterbury could never have imagined that she would see its great monasteries and famous shrine destroyed. French Huguenots who arrived in the 1680s would not have expected to spend so much of their lives in England any more than some of the asylum seekers who come here today. And on a personal level, I can add that when I moved to Canterbury, in 1974, on a one-year appointment, <laughs> I never dreamt that I would still be here nearly 50 years later, still less that I would spend my retirement writing a history of the city that has become very much my home. I We'll take one or two questions, if there are any. Um, but if anyone wants to ask a question, could I ask that you wait until um, a microphone is brought to you so everyone can hear it? But it maybe you don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yes, there's one right at the back there, Philip. Thank you, Doreen, for a wonderful talk. Could I just ask, if you could go back to any period in Canterbury's history, which would it be? Oh, goodness. <laughs> If I could go back to any period in Canterbury's history, which would it be? I think it would depend on which class of society I had been born into. <laughs> I think it would depend in what sort of health I was. Um, and I suppose um, this is the real giveaway I think I'd quite like to go back to the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Then can I explain to you um, how you can get a book, should you wish one? Um, I thought we'd put some out on the front for people to look at. <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> we have got more boxes of books down under the, ta under the tables. Um, 